Good morning and welcome to the uh, Select Committee on Energy Independence and Global Warming. Over the last two years, the Select Committee has examined closely how the U.S. can fight climate change and improve our energy security. But we are not in this fight alone, and the progress that our country can make is deeply dependent on the progress that developing countries are making. That is the focus of today's hearing, to take an assessment based on the facts that exist in 2009, not as they existed five or ten years ago, of steps taken by the key developing countries to address global warming. This inquiry is important because Americans rightly want to know that they are not the only ones altering their policies to combat global warming. This inquiry is also important because many members have rightly expressed concern about maintaining the competitiveness of critical industry sectors, and they want to know that other countries are joining the fight and requiring their industries to move away from business as usual. A discussion on what developing countries are doing needs to be fueled by current facts and not by old perceptions. One old perception is that China is unwilling to join the fight against climate change and is wedded to growth at any cost. A current reality is that China has already adopted an energy efficiency law that far exceeds anything on the law books of our country. Other examples abound of how developing countries are making progress. I am not suggesting that the developing countries are doing everything they can do, and they are certainly not doing everything that needs to be done. But as we undertake climate change legislation in our country, we should understand the steps taken by key developing countries around the world. China, India, India Brazil, Mexico, South Africa are some of the biggest emitters of the developing world. Over the last years, all of these countries have displayed an increasing awareness of the need to act. Just last week, President Obama acknowledged China in his speech to the joint session of Congress for having launched the largest effort in history to make their economy energy efficient. Also last week, Greenpeace welcomed India's National Climate Plan's first step, a market mechanism that could phase out 400 million incandescent bulbs by 2012. In December last year, Mexico set an aspirational target to cut in half its 2002 carbon emissions by 2050. And the Brazilian government released its national plan on climate change. These are encouraging signs of action. But the world has to do more, and the world has to act together. Despite the action and efforts shown around the world, emissions continue to rise. We have to reverse this trend, and certainly developed countries will have to show clear commitment and live up to their promises, and developing countries will need to support uh, when accelerating their action. To ensure that the world achieves the needed reductions, we need a strong agreement in Copenhagen. And we need to monitor and verify the efforts all across the world. We need to be sure that promises lead to action, that plans get implemented, that results live up to expectations. The United States must show that it will lead this effort. Only by doing so, we will collectively be able to win the fight against dangerous climate change. Let me turn now and recognize the uh, ranking member of the Select Committee, the gentleman from Wisconsin, Mr. Sensenbrenner. Well, thank you very much. Um, I guess the cash register is on this side of the aisle because last week we learned how expensive our response to climate change is going to be. President Obama's budget blueprint established mm -hmm. potential domestic costs in today's hearing will highlight the mounting international demands. The world is expecting increased energy efficiency from the developing world, and the developing world is demanding compensation in return. We have known for a while that the cap and tax policy, which is my name for the carbon trading system President Obama is advocating, will significantly harm the U.S. economy. In his budget blueprint last week, President Obama sketched out a cap and tax plan that will require approximately $80 billion a year from U.S. taxpayers. By 2020, Americans will have paid $646 billion to fund this scheme. And while $646 billion is a shocking number, or at least it used to be, it pales in, in comparison to the demands of developing ca countries. India's government stated that the developed nations owe billions of dollars to developing nations to compensate for climate change. In its submission to the UN 
framework convention on climate change the indian government argued that this funding should be a legal obligation for developed countries that cannot be subject to the decisions of developed country governments or legislatures uh, how that flies in the face of our constitution's requirement that nothing be paid out of the treasury except by appropriation i don't know they added that this funding should not be in the form of loans and that the providers of finance cannot be discretionary donors but must be legally obligated assessees. In its own submission, China argued that the developed nation should provide new, additional, adequate, predictable, and sustainable funding of at least a half to one percent of a nation's GDP over and above existing foreign aid. The Massachusetts Institute of Technology's Joint Program on the Science and Policy of uh, Global Change, a supporter of cap and tax policies, estimated that welfare costs to developed countries could be over $400 billion per year in 2020, rising to over $3 trillion per year in 2050, and over a $1 trillion of this would come from the United States. As the MIT study notes, this scheme goes well beyond compensating for mitigating costs and turns the mitigation policy into an instrument for global income redistribution, unquote. Several developing countries have made efforts to increase their energy efficiency, which is good. But many of these countries have publicly stated their good intentions and aspirational goals to reduce their emissions, but it is their willingness and ability to actually implement these policies that will determine the ultimate success of our global efforts. China has already resisted enforcement of WTO's trade rules. The U.S. Trade Representative found in its 2008 report to Congress on China's WTO compliance that, quote, China has yet to fully implement important commitments, and in other areas, significant questions have been arisen regarding China's adherence to ongoing WTO obligations including core WTO principles. In my role as a member and former chairman of the Judiciary Committee, I sure have found that out due to the lack of enforcement by China of uh, intellectual property rights laws, even though the Chinese law on the books looks as good as the United States' law or the laws that are in the European Union. A post-Kyoto Treaty cannot succeed without China's participation. But can we expect China's compliance with the Climate Change Treaty given its history with the WTO? I think the answer is obvious. Today's witness, Lee Lane, a resident fellow at the American Enterprise Institute, rightly recognizes that technological development is the crucial long-term priority. Politics is the art of the possible, but current proposals for emissions reductions go beyond not only what's politically possible, but also what's actually achievable. Nations cannot afford to meet greenhouse gas reduction goals without substantial advances in energy technology. The development of technology, not higher taxes or global wealth redistribution schemes, should be where Congress focuses its efforts to confront climate change. I look forward to hearing from our witnesses today and learning more about what role technology can play in these important climate change negotiations leading to the U.N. Conference of the Parties in Copenhagen this December. Thank you. Okay, the gentleman's time has expired. The Chair recognizes the gentleman from Missouri, Mr. Cleaver. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thanks for this uh, opportunity. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'm absolutely convinced that the American economy can be retooled to meet the challenge of climate change and that the second uh, industrial revolution of this country uh, can be a, a revolution uh, that would green our economy uh, in more ways than one. Uh, but I think that we are really uh, in a uh, unique position, maybe even an awkward position because of the last decade, uh, almost a decade of uh, ignoring the science of uh, climate change, and we are faced now with an opportunity uh, for the President to go to Copenhagen uh, in December uh, of this year, and uh, I think that uh, in Copenhagen the President uh, is going to be watched and listened to perhaps uh, in a uh, 
more serious way than uh, maybe ever a, a, a president or an American official has d dealt with this issue of climate change. And so I'm interested in hearing from the panel uh, the things you think we must do before Copenhagen, before next December, in order to have credibility uh, when the President uh, speaks on the last day of the conference. So I appreciate your presence. I hope to be able to probe your, uh, your, your considerable knowledge of the subject uh, in order to uh, uh, ascertain information that will be helpful uh, as we, uh, as this committee continues uh, to study this issue and make uh, recommendations uh, to uh, the speaker. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back the balance of my time. We thank the gentleman. The chair recognizes the gentleman from New York, Mr. Hall. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, for holding this hearing and uh, also for our panel of witnesses today. Uh, the world is on the cusp of uh, exciting developments uh, following the Bali meetings, a framework for negotiations uh, developing what could lead to the first real international climate change effort. At least that's my hope for the Copenhagen meetings. Uh, an international agreement must have enforceable targets. It must take care to rein in irresponsible practices by developing countries, particularly China and India. But we must realize that while large and growing, these nations have much lower standards of living than ours, and we need to be sympathetic to their desire to achieve what we in this country have been calling the American dream for more than two centuries. At the same time, our economy is suffering, and manufacturing is on the decline here at home. Any climate legislation that this Congress considers need to take into account the impact it will have on people and businesses in the United States. So there are twin challenges. How do we get China and India and the developing world to agree to climate change goals that do not stifle their own growth? And how do we limit our own contribution of greenhouse gases without further crippling the United States economy? I believe in that answer we can find opportunity. American businesses can lead the way in renewable and energy efficient technology. For example, just last week we had several witnesses testify about the work their companies are doing on en energy efficiency and smart growth technology. In the Hudson Valley of New York, we have innovators working on waste to energy, solar, biomass, and investors looking to fund renewable projects, and such low-tech solutions as weatherization, which would uh, hopefully uh, capture the 30 to 40, 30 to 40 percent uh, heat loss or air conditioning loss, as the case may be, from uh, individual homes. And uh, we, in our stimulus recovery package, uh, passed a uh, large enough amount that New York State this year uh, will be receiving about twice for weatherization what the entire country received last year. And a proportionate uh, effort is being made nationwide. It's a serious uh, conservation effort, and I'm very proud of it, and I'm proud of the fact that my county, Dutchess County, will be hiring five times as many work crews to go out and do insulation, storm doors, storm windows, weather stripping. We're not talking high-tech new inventions. We're talking basic good building practices to save energy and save those homeowners money. It's time to har harness our ingenuity to solve the climate crisis and export manufactured goods once again. We can fuel the carbon efficient global economy with just a little bit of investment. Uh, the economic stimulus was a good start, but more can be done. And if we do that, we can help the developing countries meet their targets, make the planet a better place, and make some money or save some money for our people at the same time. We should not be afraid of this challenge. We should welcome it. And thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. The gentleman's time has expired. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Colorado, Mr. Salazar. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. It's an honor to be here with you today and uh, with you and Mr. Sensenbrenner. Um, I, uh, I share some of the same values as you do. Um, I come from uh, the, the Colorado San Luis Valley, which is uh, very rich in, in, in solar. We have a 150-day average uh, uh, of sunshine um, in Colorado. And I believe that uh, you know, and renewable energy and the world's need to, for energy conservation and development of renewable sources of energy. I think that the world um, um, has a, a real need for some type of, of um, moderate, uh, common sense uh, legislation and talks and negotiations to move, um, you know, our climate change uh, issues uh, uh, to the forefront. I also share the concerns of Mr. Sensenbrenner and Mr. Hall when we talk about what our um,
current uh, economic situation is in this country. Um, but I, I want to, to, to talk a little bit today about how I believe that we can actually curb uh, some of our carbon emissions. I want to make sure that agriculture is, is heard in all this debate. Um, I believe that agriculture can be a part of, of our uh, carbon sequestration issue. Um, I'm looking forward today. Today is my first day, and um, the speaker asked me to serve on this committee. Um, uh, while I'm not an expert in energy issues, I do want to be a part of the solution. So thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and I yield back. I, I thank uh, the gentleman very much, and whether it be solar or wind or, or fossil fuels or uh, agriculture, Colorado, uh, in a lot of ways, is the microcosm of uh, all of the solutions that we can propose. If I may just say that uh, in Colorado, in Colorado San Luis Valley, we had uh, up to last year the largest solar farm uh, in the U United States, 80-acre uh, solar farm that produced uh, close to 12 megawatts of solar power. Uh, they are looking now at building uh, somewhere in the neighborhood of 550 uh, megawatt uh, concentrated solar farm in, in that area. So I'm very interested in, in, in those issues. Okay. I thank the gentleman. I thank the gentleman for uh, serving on the committee. He's going to make an invaluable contribution. Um, let me now turn to our panel, and our first witness is Mr. Carter Roberts. Mr. Roberts is the president and the CEO of the World Wildlife Fund. WWF is supported by close to 5 million members globally, and its affiliates work in more than 100 countries before joining WWF, Mr. Roberts worked on strategic planning and new international programs with the Nature Conservancy. Uh, we welcome you, Mr. Roberts. Whenever you are ready, please begin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, thank you to the committee for your leadership in educating the American public and Congress about the threat of climate change and what we need to do about it. And I'm grateful for the opportunity to provide testimony today on behalf of our five million members and on behalf of our programs around the world. As you point out, we operate in all these countries around the world, often with programs led by um, nationals, uh, leaders in those countries who have a deep appreciation for the context in these countries. And we, are, we have an observer status for the UNFCC uh, process, and often we serve as members of delegations from these countries to the negotiating process. So it's from this vantage point and with this perspective that I offer my testimony today. Conventional wisdom says that developing countries do not take climate change seriously and that they will be an obstacle to a global deal. Nothing could be further from the truth. Key developing countries are taking concrete steps to reduce emissions at home. They are also leading in many ways international negotiations as we speak for the sake of our climate, our economy, and our international competitiveness, I urge us to follow their lead. I have three key points today that I want to make. One is that things have changed. The other is that they've changed for good reasons. And finally, that the U.S. needs to respond in kind both in our domestic legislation and in our international negotiations. So first, throughout much of the 1990s, the developed world looked to developing countries to take the lead in solving the climate change problem. That was clear. Their posture was understandable. They had contributed little in the way of emissions and were suffering some of the greatest impacts, all at the same time that the world's largest emitter was doing very little. Over the past year in particular, developing countries have taken action to reduce their own emissions at home and have been constructive in advancing solutions at an international stage. Two examples, renewable energy and deforestation or avoided deforestation. Renewable energy standard is a, is a classic part of any country's seriousness in replacing high carbon fuels with ones that produce zero emissions. During the past several years, as the U.S. has debated whether or not to have a renewable energy standard, Brazil, India, China, Mexico, the Philippines, and many others have adopted their own and have begun, begun implementing it with some success. Second, deforestation. You know that deforestation is the second largest sector in terms of CO2 emissions around the world, more than all the cars, trucks, planes, trains, and boats in the world. 
bringing Brazil and Indonesia to the top five emitters around the world. In December, Brazil announced a bold plan to cut their emissions from deforestation by 70 percent in 10 years. This would avoid 4.8 billion tons of CO2 emissions equivalent to over two-thirds what the U.S. produces alone. To back this up, Brazil has made a number of commitments at home. First, they have created one of the most impressive forest conservation programs in the world, creating a series of parks in the Amazon roughly equal to the size of the state of California. Second, they develop a world-class system of monitoring that has few peers around the world and is now regularly reporting on their progress in avoiding deforestation. And finally, they are creating governance systems, particularly at a state level, that provide the resources and the enforcement with local communities to reduce deforestation right at the edge of the forest frontier. Meeting all these goals will be tough. Uh, Brazil is committed to it, but it can't do it alone. It will need our help. It will need technology. It will need know-how, and it will need some financial flows to make this happen. The reason these developing countries are taking these steps are pretty obvious. They are very similar to our own, risk and opportunity. The risks that they see are even far greater than ours because they have billions of people who live below the poverty line and they lack the capital and the financial resources to respond, to adapt, and to change. And so for nations with populations living at a subsistence level, even modest amounts of climate change change their water supplies, it changes their food supplies, and uh, runs the risk of severe crop failures. Wait and see is not an option. They also see that addressing climate change produ produces the promise of economic security and even growth. Dramatic swings in energy prices are problematic for countries with little financial reserves. And those countries who are able to develop homegrown energy supplies are able to become leaders in areas like renewables. Right now, China leads the world in installed renewable energy capacity and is projected to be the world leader by the end of this year in exports of renewable energy solutions. Finally, my last point, the U.S., as we enact cap-and-trade legislation here at home and enter international negotiations, we should do so with developing countries in mind. Why? First, it is a global crisis and it requires a global solution, just as the economic crisis requires countries to come together. Second, a ton emitted in China or a ton emitted in Brazil is just as costly to us at home as a ton emitted in Ohio. We need to ensure, just as we are creating green jobs at home and sending funds at home to, to drive solutions, that we also ensure that funds flow to those countries where low-cost solutions can be found. We need to solve the problem by solving it globally. Third, by building the capacity of other countries, we are building more stable societies. We are also building potential markets for technological solutions. For too long, the U.S. has invented renewable technologies only to see other countries own those markets by having the right regulatory framework and by having good relations and markets with other countries. Last but not least, the U.S. has had a long legacy of reaching out to other countries and solving global problems, bringing our know-how, our capacity, our, our money, and our resources to help countries in need and to create a leadership role for us abroad. We have done it with HIV AIDS. We have done it on security issues. We need to do it on climate change. In summary, the developing world has changed as we speak. They are playing a leading role. They are taking action at home. It is time for us as we pass cap and trade legislation here at home and enter international negotiations to respond to their leadership and to respond in kind. It is in our best interest to do so. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Roberts, very much. And our next uh, witness is Ms. Barbara Finnamore. Uh, she is a senior attorney at the Natural Resources Defense Council and is the founder and director of NRDC's China program. She is also co-founder and president of the China-U.S. Energy Efficiency uh, Alliance. She has worked and lived in, in Greater China for nearly 20 years, and she has flown in from Beijing for this hearing, for which we are very grateful. 
Whenever you're ready, please begin. Thank you, Chairman Markey, Ranking Member Sensenbrenner, and distinguished members of the committee. It is my pleasure to be here with you today to discuss China's national greenhouse gas mitigation efforts and achievements and challenges. Uh, I also have three major points. One is that China is, is currently pursuing an aggressive and ambitious greenhouse gas mitigation program as indicated by its 11th five-year plan, which runs from 2006 to 2010. That plan includes a goal of reducing its energy intensity, energy consumption per unit GDP, 20 percent from 2005 levels to 2010, uh, which equals 4 percent reduction per year. It also sets a target of increasing the share of re renewables in the energy mix by 10 percent by 2010 and 15 percent by 2020. If China succeeds in achieving this goal and reducing its energy intensity by 20 percent, it will avoid emitting approximately 1.5 billion tons of CO2, which constitutes the largest single greenhouse gas mitigation program by any country. And I'll detail that, uh, what that progress is on that in a moment. But I'd also like to emphasize that China has reasons for the greenhouse gas mitigation programs um, that it has already achieved that provide a lot of um, room for reaching mutually beneficial uh, uh, common ground between the United States and China as they seek to achieve an international climate treaty. And these include, in particular, um, China's growing awareness of the uh, severe impacts on its own country of climate change. Uh, I think the turning point first came in 2006 when China issued a national uh, climate change assessment program by 40 different ministries, a 400-page report, which for the first time detailed the impacts that climate change would have on the areas where China is already most vulnerable. It's water. Uh, supplies. It has only one quarter of the average water uh, resources per capita as the world average. Uh, they have already seen increasing droughts, increasing flooding in other regions. And um, just yesterday, they announced the plan to build 59 new reservoirs to capture the water resources in the rest west due to rapid melting of the glaciers. So the cost of uh, adaptation is becoming increasingly apparent to China, also impacts on their agricultural productivity and also on the uh, economic development, which is located primarily along their very long coastline and how it would be impacted by sea level rise. I'd also mention energy security as a primary motivating factor for China in its greenhouse gas mitigation efforts um, and also social stability. They're quite concerned about the high uh, cost of its unsustainable energy path on uh, the health of its people and on the environment. Um, World Bank, as you may have known, has uh, estimated that 750,000 people die each year from environmental uh, air and water pollution in China. So uh, also the economic downturn as it's affected China these days um, is going to um, lead to increased social instability if they don't create more green jobs. So there's a, a real opportunity here for holding hands across the ocean and finding green technologies that will benefit the global economic recovery. Um, in particular, and the third point is, despite all that China is doing, there's a tremendous amount more that needs to be done and that can be done. Uh, particularly through strengthened U.S. and China engagement on clean energy issues. But just to, uh, uh, just to highlight a few of the efforts that China is already making um, in its greenhouse gas mitigation program, one of their major um, uh, motivation factors is the desire to restructure their economic um, system away from the heavy industry that is the cause of the largest percentage of their greenhouse gas emissions, and in fact, approximately 77 percent of all their energy demand. They have instituted uh, policies already to help move their economy away from high uh, polluting, uh, highly inefficient steel, chemical, cement industries. Um, 
And not only that, but even though they are continuing to grow their thermal power capacity to the tune of two coal-fired power plants a week, it's important to note that that is accompanied by the shutting down of the smallest, most highly inefficient power plants so that there is a net increase in the uh, e uh, efficiency of their thermal power generation, which is leading to a dramatic reduction in greenhouse gas emissions from that sector. Uh, in the energy efficiency side, they're also closing backward production capacity, slowing the expansion of high energy consuming uh, industries through the elimination or reduction of export tax rebates for energy intensive products. Uh, they have a renewed em emphasis on energy efficiency, particularly in the industrial sector, focusing on the top 1,000 highest energy consuming industries. And our evidence indicates that they are on track to meet or surpass their target savings for that particular top 1,000 factories, which would translate into a reduction in CO2 emissions of 300 to 450 million tons of CO2. They are putting money into funding energy efficiency at the national and provincial level. Uh, last, in 2007, they allocated $3.4 billion U.S. dollars to promote energy efficiency and re reduce emissions, and $41.8 billion renminbi, or $6 billion in 2008, for the same purpose. They're beginning to implement provincial and municipal demand-side management programs which use a portion of the revenue that utilities collect from their customers to reduce peak load and overall energy demand through large-scale investments in energy efficiency. And a World Bank study concludes that with the proper policies and incentives, these programs could avoid the need to build more than 100 gigawatts of electric capacity by 2020. Could you summarize, please? Yes. On, although they have made uh, significant progress, much more can be done. China's energy intensity is currently four times that of the United States and nine times that of Japan. In order to make further progress in meeting their ambitious goals, there's a need for increasing technical capacity in energy auditing and energy efficiency retrofit design, monitoring and enforcing standards in industry power plants and buildings. These are all areas in which the United States and China can profitably cooperate. So in sum, China is working aggressively to improve its energy efficiency, reduce the carbon intensity of its energy mix. A recent study by McKinsey Global Institute indicates that if China pursued energy efficiency to the full extent possible and cut coal to 34 percent of its power supply, it could cut its projected greenhouse emissions by 2030 nearly in half. Thank so you, Ms. Thank you, Ms. Fenimore, mm -hmm. very much. Uh, our next witness is uh, Mr. Lee Lane. Mr. Lane is a resident fellow at the American Enterprise Institute and is co-director of AEI's Project on Climate Engineering. Mr. Lane was previously a consultant to Charles River Associates International, where he produced analyses of climate and energy issues. He also helped found the Climate Policy Center. We welcome you, Mr. Lane. Whenever you are ready, please begin. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman and uh, uh, Mr. Sensenberger, Brenner, um, and other members of the committee. I'm delighted to have the opportunity to appear before you today and discuss these issues, which I think are, are extremely important in the uh, overall evolution of, of climate policy. Uh, my name is Lee Lane, and I'm a resident fellow, as the Chairman just said, at uh, AEI. AEI is an organization that uh, conducts uh, policy analysis and research and, and education uh, on a broad range of public policy issues. Uh, AEI does not take uh, organizational positions on these issues, uh, and the uh, views that I'm going to express here this morning are entirely my own, not, not necessarily those of the Institute. Um, Rising amounts of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere pose, I believe, several worrisome challenges. A at the same time, many difficulties seem to rule out quick or easy solutions to the problems that are being posed to us. My statement suggests some ways in which the U.S. might nonetheless make progress. It makes three main points. I noticed that all 
three speakers who have spoken so far have three main points. So uh, especially on that ground, we, ha we have grounds for agreement. The, the first point is that I think we need to acknowledge that whereas there, there seems to be an agreement, a global consensus even, uh, on the need to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, that seeming agreement masks what I think is a distinct lack of consensus about who should pay to make these reductions in, in greenhouse gases. Uh, China, India, Russia, uh, and many other countries that have expressed uh, agreement in principle that emissions should be reduced ha have not been especially forthcoming in incurring costs to actually achieve those emissions reductions. Now, I, I certainly hear and I've, I've read the statements of, uh, of my colleagues on the panel here, uh, and, and I know that uh, there have been a number of actions taken uh, in China and elsewhere, but fundamentally those steps appear to me to be what we in this country used to call no regrets policies. Well, that's fine. Uh, we should welcome whatever emissions reductions occur as a result of those policies. But I don't think we should take those actions as suggesting that the world is any place close to being willing to bear the costs that would be required to really reduce greenhouse gas emissions to the level that would be required to halt climate change and actually stabilize concentrations of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. We're very, very far from even discussing changes of, of that scale. My, my second point is I, I believe that it's true that the, the U.S. cannot create a global consensus where none exists. Attempts to lead by example or to use trade sanctions to change China's behavior are likely to be both costly and ineffective. For developed countries to pay China's abatement costs is not an appealing option either. A recent MIT study, the one that Mr. Sensenbrenner referred to, estimated that carrying this principle to its logical conclusion would, for the U.S. alone, entail annual income transfers to the developing world of $200 billion by 2020 and nearly $1 trillion by 2050. Each dollar spent in this way is, in effect, a dollar added to the U.S. trade deficit. This would heap a huge additional burden on a U.S. economy that, during this same period, will already be struggling to make many other daunting structural adjustments. Third, and my final point, is that the U.S. climate policy should candidly consider the likelihood that the needed global consensus on paying for abatement will be long in coming. If so, the world will probably fail to reach today's ambitious targets for stabilizing climate. Rather than striving to do the impossible, U.S. policy should focus on coping with the unavoidable, adopting a modest, stable, and gradually rising price on carbon emissions, I, I believe, is one step that we should take. An attached statement uh, at the back of my statement uh, discusses a number of other options uh, that I think are important, especially focused on technological change. And um, I think several of these are, in fact, even more important than putting a price on carbon emissions. But I think a price on carbon emissions of the right kind would be an appropriate step, too. Finally, I guess I need to conclude with a, with a note of caution. The U.S., like most other nations, has a real stake in curbing global greenhouse gas emissions. But if our good intentions lead us to incur costs that exceed the benefits to the United States, I fear those policies may not prove to be durable. And as many people have noted, climate policy is a marathon, not a sprint. And it's really important to muster a sustained effort. Uh, thank you very much, and I ask my statement to be uh, included in the record. Without objection, it will be included in the record in its entirety. 
Uh, our final uh, witness is Mr. Ned Helm. He is the president and co-founder of the Center for Clean Air Policy. Over the last two decades, Mr. Helm has advised not only Congress, state governments, and the European Commission, uh, but also developing countries from Brazil uh, to China. So we welcome you, Mr. Helm. Whenever you are ready, please begin. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Sensenbrenner, and other members of the committee. It is certainly a pleasure to have a chance to speak to you this morning. I am Ned Helm, the President of the Center for Clean Air Policy. And uh, my task this morning is to sort of set the stage in terms of where we are in the negotiation process and, and complement what we have heard from my colleagues. Let me start by putting a slide on the board here, and this sort of summarizes what you heard from the colleagues to the left and right of me. Uh, this compiles the reductions that will be achieved by 2010 by China, Brazil, and Mexico under laws that are currently on the books in these countries. And as you can see, the red block is more than what we would do here in the U.S. under the Lehman Warner Bill as uh, structured last year by 2015. And it is comparable to the level of reduction uh, we can expect from the Europeans with their minus 30 uh, percent reduction target. So uh, as my colleagues have shown you with the specifics, the sum total of this is quite substantial, and, and the world has really changed in terms of where we were in 1997 in Kyoto when uh, very little was being done and where we are today where developing countries have really stepped up and, and carried their part of the burden here. Having said that, I want to build on what you said, Mr. Chairman, that uh, this is great stuff, but it's not enough. If we look at where we are going, we could zero out all the emissions of the developed nations by 2050 and we wouldn't get to the targets we're talking about. So we clearly need a substantial additional effort by China and other key developing countries, and I think that will be forthcoming in the process. Uh, my second point is really to talk about the Bali Action Plan. Uh, I think this is a major breakthrough from where we were in 1997. For the first time, we have agreement among developed and developing countries uh, that both sides will commit to specific actions that will reduce, uh, in the case of developing countries, growth in emissions. And that is premised on monitorable and reportable and verifiable action, so on both sides. And it's also premised on the thought that we will have support in technology, in finance, and in building capacity from developed nations to developing nations. That's the heart of the Bali Action Plan. Uh, and it's a real breakthrough in terms of the thinking and the way in which this process has evolved over the years. In that action plan, we're talking about taking nationally appropriate mitigation actions. And there are three types of these actions that are kicking around in the debate at this point. The first is unilateral action. And these numbers you see up here, a lot of what's here are actions that developing countries are doing on their own. These are not reductions that they are are being bought and paid for through the clean development mechanism. In the past, you know, we've, in the Kyoto Protocol, basically the only role was for projects in developing countries could generate credits and those could be sold to uh, the Europeans, for example, to meet the uh, goals of, of the reductions by their companies. In this case, we're talking about a real reduction by developing countries on their own that's a contribution to the atmosphere. So in addition to what developed nations do, we're going to see some real action by developing countries with some real costs. I would take issue with Lee's contention that all this is just no regrets uh, that, that will really move us forward. So that's the first and most important piece. The second is a set of actions that would be premised on a conditionality of we will go further if developed nations provide support in the financing and technology and capacity building. And then the third is if we've set a law, let's say China sets a, an RPS at 20 percent, as they've done, if they do more than 20 percent, that could be turned into carbon credits to sell. So they'd have to meet the target on their own. If they go beyond it, they could market those on the carbon market. Now let me take you to a specific example, and Mr. Chairman, you alluded to this in your opening remarks. Mexico in December in Poznan put together the first really comprehensive approach that would show you what a national appropriate mitigation action, a sectoral approach, would look like. Mexico proposed to set targets for reduction in cement, steel, oil refining, and electricity, three of those very internationally competitive sectors. Uh, they proposed that they would go further than the initial targets, significantly further, if there was support financially from developed nations to move that forward. And they said they would do this through a cap-and-trade program, a program that could combine with a U.S. cap-and-trade or a Canadian cap-and-trade program on a, on a North American basis. So, very significant effort here. And when we talk about the financing, we're not talking about big grants. In their case, they're talking about loans that would help them overcome financial barriers. The banks in Mexico don't have the ability to assess 
uh, energy efficiency programs, this is the kind of thing we're looking at. So a very, very significant and very concrete proposal for Mexico that could move us forward. I think when we think about mitigation actions, we want to focus really on the six to ten largest developing countries. They're responsible for 80 to 90 percent of the emissions. We don't really care about Zimbabwe and Morocco and so on. We really care about Brazil, China, Mexico, uh, Korea, India, uh, South Africa. That's the, those are the key players. And so it's a more workable and doable deal than it might at first appear. Let me turn to the question of the United States' role in this. I think the U.S. is critical. We are the linchpin of a Copenhagen agreement. And I think the positive reactions you've seen internationally to President Obama's comments is 19, minus 14 percent below current levels is, is a very positive sign. I think it can have a very positive impact in terms of moving this debate. I think there'll be two tests for us. First test is what is our target? Can we get that target together? And I'm optimistic here with the Congress that we can move something uh, through the House at least that would give us a real signal to help our negotiators talk about what kind of target we could take. And the second question is, will we help financially? And that I recognize is a tougher question, but it's a key question. To make this ball move, we need to do it. And again, let's be clear, we're talking about help with technology, we're talking about capacity, we're talking about loans and, and breaking barriers. We're not talking about huge block grants like uh, might, be, might be envisioned if you look at the India proposal, which is, I think, a, an outlier in terms of the real thinking on the table. Let me close by addressing uh, Mr. Hall's left, but he said, they're twin challenges, and I think he's right on the money. He said the two challenges are how do we deal with impacts on our companies in the United States, and how do we also encourage China and India to go further? And I think the answer is very uh, clear. On the issue of carbon leakage, in the U.S. we have two choices. We could either give allowances free to key industrial sectors that are endangered, like cement, like steel, like oil refining. And or we could do border tax adjustments, as I think uh, one of you referred to this earlier. That the, uh, in fact, Lee mentioned this in terms of border. He said this is a real problem. Basically, putting uh, any uh, exports coming to the United States would have to buy carbon allowances. I think that's very provocative in the debate, not very helpful. I think giving allowances out can take care of the carbon part of the problem, so the companies are held harmless in terms of this phase through 2020 until China, Brazil, Mexico have taken similar action in the cement industry and the steel industry, which I think we will see. The second half of Mr. Hall's challenge was how do we get China to move? Border tax adjustments is not the way to go. China exports 1 percent of its steel to the United States. Putting a tax on Chinese steel is going to have no impact on their policies internationally. However, incentives like we just talked about, where we help them with the technology, where we take the CCS technology that we're working on and we do it with them in China at the same time we're doing it here. We don't do the old game of develop here and 20 years later we put it in the developing countries. As my colleague here said, two coal plants a week, we've got to deal with CCS now. So let me close. My final thought for you is I think we had a real breakthrough two weeks ago when the U.S. and the negotiations on a mercury treaty switched its position. Seven years we have said no international agreement on re regulating mercury emissions. In two weeks, the Obama administration changed direction, and that completely dominated the discussion. China, India, Argentina, Mexico, all of whom had been opposed to a mercury agreement, switched sides and said, yes, we're on board. I think it shows you what's possible with the kind of leadership we have from you guys and also from our president. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Helm, very much. Uh, we'll now turn to uh, questions from our uh, committee members, and we'll begin with the gentleman from Missouri, Mr. Cleaver. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Lane, uh, on page 10 of your testimony in uh, the, the uh, fifth paragraph, you said America is well endowed with the resources required to make the needed adjustments. Uh, on page 12, you said our responses need to account for the limitations on our resources and our abilities to affect the preferences of other societies. Can you uh, help me fix the difference? Sure. Um, I think that the United States, uh, and I think this is generally agreed, uh, because it is a very big country, because it's quite a wealthy country, uh, has, and because it's uh, developed and has a well-developed public health service uh, and so forth, has a lot of human and material capital, is probably better able to adapt to climate change than most poorer countries are likely to be. It, it, it also has a more temperate climate to begin with. 
so that, say, in comparison with India or a country that's much closer, located much closer to the equator, we're less likely to experience in the early decades of climate change really severe harm. A at the same time, all of that being true, it, it's still true that we don't have infinite resources to help the entire world convert from fossil fuels to alternative energy and conservation and so forth. So well, on that point, I and, and it, I'd like to, excuse me for interrupting, but, but I have five minutes. That's fine. But, but on, that, on that point, I'd like to engage the, uh, all the panelists. Uh, do you believe that it is possible for uh, the United States and Copenhagen to uh, create for China and India in particular, but all of the, uh, m many of the, the developing nations, uh, the belief that there is a real connection uh, between uh, sustainable economic strength and uh, pampering the environment? I certainly agree. I think that's very much in line with the kind of things you see in the submissions from those countries. They clearly, South Africa has been the leader, but this idea of dealing with carbon and at the same time promoting sustainable development is a key element of the G77 of the developing countries' perspective. And I think they're already on that page, and what they're looking for is help with the technologies and with some of the new opportunities to really pursue that ideal. So I think we're on the same page on that issue. Um, Roberts. <coughs> It's, I, I think for most developing countries, the environment is clearly in their minds where their food comes from, where their water comes from, and, and they see the risks of that environment changing because of climate change. So it, they see it more clearly than we do because in places like Indonesia, they walk out their backyard, they catch the fish, and now as the ocean's becoming more acidified, they're seeing the coral reefs and the fisheries change in front of their eyes. And so um, they're also seeing the sea level rise in their, their, uh, their backyards. And, and they don't have the ability to move like we do. So I, I, um, I find in those countries a profound awareness of the relationship between their livelihoods and keeping their environment intact. And that's the main motivation for moving forward. So I, I see that as... Um, a powerful impetus for having that conversation in Copenhagen. I think it's, I think it's going to happen. Uh, thank you. What, um, I, I want to find out whether the, the, uh, the, the three witnesses agree with uh, Mr. Lane's uh, testimony that uh, a global agreement, a global pact on greenhouse gases, uh, ga gas caps, uh, with full trading of emissions allowances is probably not possible in Copenhagen. Do you believe there is an agreement to be, to be made in Copenhagen? I think there is. I think, uh, as I su suggested in my testimony, I think there's, we will have agreement on the targets for the developed nations. I think we'll have agreement on this architecture of how we proceed with developing countries. So we'll have agreement on developing countries putting a series of nationally appropriate mitigation actions on the table and conditioning that on the financing. And I think we'll see the Annex I countries coming forward and saying, here's the range of financing we might be able to put forward. And then I think in 2010, we'll really negotiate the final deal in terms of, we'll do this and you'll help us here. We'll do this and you'll help us here. And here's how it amount, what it amounts to. We're talking about a registry where developing countries will re record what they're proposing, what they're looking for, and at the end of the day, exactly what we've agreed to. So I think it's doable. I think it's really a two-step. I think at Copenhagen, we get the structure done, and then after Copenhagen, after we've passed our law and we know what financing we can help with, I think we get into the more of the detail. But I think clearly, with the U.S. leadership, uh, it's quite possible. So it's possible we go to Copenhagen, Copenhagen shooting for the stars and may hit the moon? I, I think uh, Copenhagen is an important step along the way. I think right now um, we're seeing these important bilateral conversations occur between the U.S. and China, the U.S. and Brazil, the U.S. and Europe. That lays the groundwork for differentiated commitments and the kind of exchange of financing and technology uh, that we talked about. And I believe in Copenhagen we'll see breakthroughs in framing issues like forests and deforestation and making them credible in the context of a global deal. We'll see the creation and the framing of financing mechanisms from funds to markets 
Um, and I also believe that um, we'll make some progress in terms of framing differentiated commitments. But I agree with my colleague uh, to my right that it is a step along the way. We'll also see follow-up in 2010. And, um, and it's a, we're on the right path. Copenhagen is an important moment, but it's going to be a combination of bilateral discussions and agreements in addition to the UNFCC process. The gentleman's time has expired. Chair recognizes the gentleman from Wisconsin, Mr. Sensenbrenner. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Ms. Fenimore, uh, uh, welcome back home from Beijing. Uh, my first question is, what makes you believe that the Chinese are going to act any different in keeping commitments in this area uh, than they have failed to do in keeping commitments under the WTO, particularly in the area of intellectual property rights? I think there's a very big difference between the WTO agreement and the climate change agreement. As I said earlier and detailed in my testimony, there are strong motivations and driving forces propelling China to agree to some sort of international climate negotiations that are unrelated to uh, uh, just growing its economy or competitiveness concerns. In fact, they believe that improving uh, their energy efficiency is going to increase their global competitiveness. Um, and I would also say that there is a lot of common ground here that I think needs to be explored in China's desire to move away from this high uh, um, energy, uh, high energy consuming industries, okay. which are responsible for the largest okay. percentage of their energy, okay, well, I, of their I carbon can, emissions. I can uh, uh, quote Ma Kai, who is the head of China's National Development Reform Commission, that says, our general stance is that China will not commit to any quantified emission reductions target. And that's what the chief Chinese negotiator told me when I met with him in Poznan. Now, uh, energy efficiency and reducing greenhouse gas reductions are two separate and distinct issues. And China is now emitting more greenhouse gases than the United States. So, uh, uh, you know, maybe the Chinese are believing their own press releases, but given uh, the, uh, their track record, uh, I can say that I read their press releases and, you know, I don't believe them. Now, you know, that, you know, that being said, uh, given the unanimous vote in the Senate uh, before Kyoto in 1997 and the fact that uh, our treaty requires a two-thirds vote to ratify, uh, what we're talking about here, uh, how do you get it ratified, particularly when China is talking about this wealth transfer as mandatory spending, which effectively makes China the recipient of the new foreign aid entitlement program. Uh, well, you quoted this com um, the comments made by the chief negotiator in China at the International Climate Agreement. And I would just say to you that it's, uh, for anybody who's spent any time in China, you have to understand that China, at least to my mind, uh, has some of the best negotiators in the world. And so what you're seeing is their negotiating position. and. Of course, I would suggest that they're not necessarily going to make uh, concessions at this stage in the negotiations until there is some, uh, you know, opportunity for reaching a deal. Well, um, and well, I think well, it's well, important. My time is running out. You know, let me say that uh, given the uh, last meeting in Poznan that lasted from 6 p.m. until 3 a.m. on Saturday morning, the third world led by China. Uh, was asking for more money, uh, and this is money that the first world doesn't have. Our economy is in the tank, so is, Euro so is Europe's. So aren't we talking about an academic exercise here? Because I don't know who's going to vote for a treaty that uh, uh, ends up transferring a trillion dollars uh, of U.S. money to China and India. I think there's been a real sea change since Poznan that has been brought about by the new administration here as, as forward. Well, I got, I've got a minute left. Uh, I'm, I'm, I am looking at submissions that have been made to the UNFCCC by China and India uh, last month in February, which was after the change in administration. Now, maybe the administration has changed its negotiating policy, but certainly China and India haven't. And I think one of the reasons why Kyoto failed uh, was because even President Clinton, who signed the Kyoto Protocol, recognized that 
it was unratifiable and thus never submitted to the Senate for its consideration. Uh, and uh, I guess my point is, is to do anything in this area, uh, we're going to have to do something that is politically feasible as well as accomplishing something. And uh, uh, I heard the comment of shooting for the stars and hitting the moon. Uh, I think that uh, probably the way we're going now is that this rocket will crash 100 kilometers uh, downrange uh, because of uh, uh, overestimations of what uh, can be accomplished. Remember, you do need a two-thirds vote in the Senate. My time's expired. The gentleman's time has expired, although if we'd like more. Um, no, the gentleman is a, a very good lawyer. Um, the, uh, uh, the, the chair recognizes the gentleman from uh, Colorado, Mr. Salazar. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Helm, you uh, mentioned that you thought that the legislation moving forward in the House uh, was the way to go. Um, I know that many of us in the Blue Dog Coalition believe that the Senate should move before the House uh, when it comes to uh, the climate change uh, legislation that's moving forward. Um, could you uh, expand on that? Uh, we certainly believe that we would be more successful if we could get a bill that would actually pass uh, having the votes in the Senate before it moves to the House. Uh, I guess my sense is, given the election results, uh, you know, if you'd asked me this back in September, I would have said, right, Mr. Salazar, let's do the Senate first because it's going to be our high watermark. I think the change has really shifted the game so that uh, once we're clear, and uh, Mr. Markey's got uh, the, the key subcommittee in, in Energy and Commerce that will be the, the initial battleground, but I think once we're clear there, we, we have a good chance of moving a, a good bill uh, that's well thought through through the House in a timely manner. I think in the Senate, it's a bit more divided. Uh, I think we'll have to deal more with that the gang of 15, the members who are sort of swing votes, and so I think starting out in the House makes sense. It's basically a political calculation. I don't think there's any magic. It's a matter of can we get something done that that sets a good marker and a good uh, piece out there. I thought the Dingle Boucher bill last year raised a lot of key issues. Uh, I didn't agree with the target. I thought the target was too weak, but a lot of the other stuff there was very helpful. And so I think you're further along, whereas what happened in the Senate was kind of, you know, a, a big battle over the pot of money and uh, it wasn't very constructive. And I think uh, we're in better position in the House to move first. So I, I think it makes sense. Well, I can almost assure you that what comes out of the House certainly won't come out of the Senate, and that, that's our biggest concern, and I agree that something has to be done. Uh, Mr. Lane, um, if you had to choose one action uh, before all others to further the efforts of, to address global warming, uh, what would that be? Uh, it would be to develop and implement a really carefully structured energy research and development program. Um, I think that actually Secretary Chu is talking about some of the changes that are exactly on target with what is needed, especially in the area of basic science and doing some of the longer term, more basic scientific research that is necessary to produce real cost breakthroughs for the future. Um, it, it's terribly important if we talk of, w when we talk about R&D to focus on the earlier parts of the research process that are more basic and that the private sector will not do under any circumstances. So government's got to do what only it can do. Uh, I, that's the most important thing, in my judgment, for reaching a solution. Thank you. And, um, uh, Ms. Finnemore, um, given that China is one of the leading uh, solar uh, manufacturers in the world, uh, what do you think we can do to encourage them to use more solar uh, instead of, you know, building more coal fire plants? And also, um, are they uh, retrofitting these coal fire plants to where, uh, or not retrofitting, but making them or engineering them so that in the future they can be retrofitted to? Um, eliminating carbon emissions? Both very good questions. Uh, you're right that China is a leader in uh, export of manufacturing and export of solar technologies, but it hasn't caught on yet uh, uh, domestically. And a, part, and a large part of that is the need to strengthen the policies and incentives that are 
listed actually in the renewable energy law that was passed in 2005 to implement them um, and to also uh, find ways to make sure that these uh, renewable energy technologies are connected to the grid. So there's policy incentives that need to be strengthened in China because it already has the manufacturing capability. I would add that it's already the leader in the world in solar uh, hot water heating technology. I think it captures 80% of the world market. There's uh, uh, the uh, wind power is growing 150% a year. Solar has lagged behind, and I think there's a lot more to be done in the uh, policies and incentive areas. And on your second question about the uh, coal fire plants, uh, two things. Number one, all of the plants that, that are coming online now are what's considered supercritical or ultra supercritical. So they are more efficient to begin with. Uh, they are actually blowing up the uh, smallest, most highly polluting plants, coal, coal fired plants. So there's a, you know, a, a gradual improvement in the energy efficiency and the emissions of those plants. But also, China is already um, in the process of building its first IGCC plant which is going to be coming online in the next couple of years, and they are going to be uh, uh, designing that so that the carbon can be captured and stored. So th I think this is another area where there's tremendous potential for cooperation uh, between the U.S. and China on these two uh, technologies that are in the beginning processes in both countries. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen. Time has expired. The chair recognizes the gentle lady from South Dakota. Ms. Persess Sandlin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. If I could just follow up, Ms. Finnamore, on Mr. Salazar's question there and what you just stated with regard to uh, coal fired facilities in China. Uh, you know, I think including developing nations like China in any international climate change system is an important element in a practical ch climate change strategy that's going to be broadly acceptable to the American people as some of the other questions from the members on the committee have, have noted. Um, and your testimony and your response just now to Mr. Salazar, you note that China's thermal power expansion has been accomplished by replacing older technologies, or excuse me, older plants with more modern plants, and that China is pursuing clean coal technologies, including integrated gasification combined cycle. I represent the state of South Dakota, and as you may know, South Dakota, like a lot of states throughout the Great Plains and the West, uh, utilize coal power for a very high percentage of, of our power, and there are some very exciting plans underway, uh, whether it's integrating IGCC technology or other clean coal technology in the region. And as you also, I'm sure, know, the President has spoken favorably of clean coal projects, and I think it's clear that from a practical standpoint that coal-fired power generation will continue to play a significant role in the United States for years to come. Now, given that fact and China's interest, in more efficient coal-fired facilities and in clean coal technologies, do you agree that the United States should commit the resources needed to be the world's leader in this area? <laughs> well, I'm not an expert on what the United States should do, so I would defer to some of my colleagues on that. Um, well, let me, let me ask it a different way. Uh, how many resources do you know uh, comparatively in terms of uh, what we've committed here in the United States versus what China has committed? Uh, in terms of financial resources to, to developing these technologies to date? No, I don't, but I would hap be happy to follow up with you and provide Please more do. information. Please do. That would be helpful. But I would also say I, I think it's important to note that the best way to reduce emissions from coal-fired power plants in China is to improve the energy efficiency. Studies have shown that China can cut its growth in energy demand by half just through becoming more efficient in its industrial technology and its buildings, which half of new con building construction in the world is going on in China. So that has to be the first, uh, the first uh, focus, and that is indeed China's primary, primary climate change initiative. And perhaps you could get us then the statistics on how many financial resources China has devoted to energy efficiency, and we can compare that to what we've done here in the U.S., including what was recently included in the Economic Recovery Plan. Yes, happy to. Okay, thank you. I might, I might add just to respond to your question about the CCS. Uh, China has been a participant and committed some financing to the Future Gen project, which was shelled, but I guess it's been resuscitated by the uh, uh, stimulus bill. And they are also committing financing to the Europeans, both the UK and the U European Union have committed to building a demonstration plant in China, and China will contribute to that. Okay. And in the MEM negotiations, the NDRC 
had basically said, we are ready to put the equivalent of the supercritical kind of coal plant that uh, Barb was talking about. We'll pay that part. What we're looking for is could the U.S. give a tax credit to GE or to vendor to help write down the cost. It's 30 percent more expensive just like it is here, mm -hmm. and they'd like to have that help on the technology to, to, to jointly work together. So there's a lot of interest in this, but they haven't done as much because, of course, it is higher cost as right. it is here. Well, thank you. That's very helpful, Mr. Kilmer. I appreciate it. Mr. Chairman, that's the only question I have. Great. Thank you. I, we thank you. And uh, we're going to be going to a second round, so if any if members have any additional questions, uh, I will be able to recognize them for that purpose. I'm going to recognize myself right now for uh, a question, and, and that will be just for any of you just to raise the issue of India for us uh, briefly, if one of you would like to add that to the discussion. Um, China is obviously, you know, the the issue of the day, but India is moving rapidly as well. Would one of you like to address that issue? Mr. Helm. I'll take a shot at it. I think in the negotiations, as I said sort of in response to Mr. Sensenbrenner's comments, I think India is the outlier. Uh, they have been the most um, hard line on the rhetoric about, you know, we, we have to have equal per capita emissions. They've been very hard line on the financing. They've been very hard line on not supporting unilateral actions. You notice I talked about countries are doing things and not being paid for it. To date, India has done very little that wasn't paid for in the CDM and that sort of thing. So I think if you look at the spectrum of the debate, India is at the far right along with the Saudis. And I think we can expect a pattern like we saw in the Mercury negotiations where China moved, India was embarrassed and had to sort of follow behind China. I think we probably see the same kind of patterns. So like India is the toughest nut to crack. We do some work in India. Our sense is that Indian industry is quite progressive on these issues, particularly in the key sectors, cement, steel, and so on. They are really pushing the envelope in terms of improving intensity, improving efficiency, and that sort of thing. And the difficulty is the government and getting the government to come around. So uh, I would put them in a special category in terms of uh, where we stand. Okay. Um, let's talk a little bit about um, uh, the implementation problems in these developing uh, countries. Uh, uh, there are impressive renewable energy targets in India, Brazil, uh, Mexico, uh, but give me your honest views as to the implementation uh, probability uh, in each of these countries. That would be very helpful uh, to us. We'll begin with you, Ms. Fenimore. I think you've hit upon the key problem in China. Um, and responding to what uh, some of the members had asked earlier, I do believe that there is tremendous political will at the national level to achieve its renewable energy targets and energy efficiency targets. The problem where they fall down is in implementation at the local level. Provincial govern government leaders, heads of uh, the major enterprises or factories. And what I'm very heartened to see is uh, uh, movement in this direction as well as well, although much needs to be done. And I think one of the most uh, effective mechanisms that the government's just uh, uh, put into place is a system whereby the job uh, uh, promotions and actually uh, ability to keep the jobs of the provincial governors is going to depend in part upon how well they meet these ambitious renewable energy, energy efficiency, and emission reduction goals. And I have found that that uh, in single initiative has done more to concentrate the minds of the provincial leaders who are responsible. So are you saying that in Beijing they tell the provincial governors you're going to be in or out of a job based upon your implementation of uh, renewable energy and efficiency targets? Uh, uh, well, in fact, yes. That's not the only factor that's going to be considered. But That would be the most important factor, though. Uh, well, absolutely, well, but until, the pa until recently it was only, their job security was only based on how well they grew their local GDP. Mm -hmm. um, and that's, of course, a diff because they have a different political system, we could not do this in the United States, but they have an integrated political system where provincial governors do, in fact, report to the central government. So the government has the ability to do so, and it's made a huge difference. But we understand how Tammany Hall politics work. <laughs> I mean, it didn't end that long ago in Boston. So right. we understand how... <laughs> Um, the local bosses, if they don't get the job done, might not hold on to their jobs. So uh, do you think that that is something that is likely to be enforced? Yes, we're going to see when the rubber meets the road, it'll be at the end of 2010, at the end of this current five-year plan. That's when the numbers have to come in. And, and there'll be, I'm sure, some scapegoats whose heads will roll. However, the concern I have is that the provincial governors are also responsible. Speaking. Yeah, yeah. 
Well, we hope. <laughs> not always. Not always. Um, <laughs> not always. Mr. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'd, I'd like to refer to page 11 in my, my written testimony, which I hope is, um, is going to be included in the record. It will be. Um, yes. Which uh, lists the progress that various developing countries have made against their renewable energy targets. It's an, imp it's an impressive track record. It's, um, it gives you uh, the indication that they're actually making progress. Um, I wanted to also comment on, uh, while we're talking about governors and states, um, I don't know if any members of this committee attended the governor's conference in LA that Governor Schwarzenegger held uh, this past fall, but the ownership that governors and states in the Amazon and Indonesia and China and elsewhere are taking of this issue and the leadership that they want to demonstrate to the people who vote them into office is quite clear and impressive, and particularly their desire to join in, as part of global agreements and bringing technology to bear and solutions to bear to their local population. You are saying this might be a tale of two countries, whereas in Brazil we might be better off with the provincial governors running the yeah, program in Brazil, and not the central in Brazil, government, whereas in China we might be better off with the central government running it yeah. rather than the provincial governors. So it all depends upon where the most uh, committed uh, uh, public officials are within the nation structure. But at the end of the day, we don't care what their governmental structure is as long as there is a measurable uh, improvement in their production of renewables and their uh, energy efficiency. Right. Uh, uh, Mr. Lane, I'm going to give you one minute to answer, <laughs> then I'm going to turn to Mr. Ru uh, Mr. Cleaver, and then I'll come back and follow up on my questions. Mr. Lane. I'll, I'll try to beat the minute. Um, Actually, my impression is the pr provincial uh, communist parties are actually a very important force in the central government. And we shouldn't, I think, look upon the Chinese government as an entirely top-down enterprise in which the provincial governments are uh, at operating at the behest of the central government. That's why some of the five-year plan targets in the past about uh, restraining heavy industries growth have not been implemented because the provincial governments have simply overruled the central government. Thank you, Mr. Lane. Uh, Chair recognizes the gentleman from Missouri, Mr. Kleber. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I agree. Uh, I, I think, uh, Mr. Helm, you made the comment that, that there were, uh, and Mr. Roberts as well, steps needed before Copenhagen and uh, that, that uh, that's, that's down the road. Uh, but uh, inevitably, there's going to be a lot of talk here um, uh, about how we cap emissions, uh, and there are all kinds of opinions. And I, the the uh, ranking member mentioned, uh, as he often does, uh, cap and tax. Um, uh, I am intrigued by a, a a concept that I've not heard a lot about, and and it's cap and dividend. Uh, or any of you familiar with this system? And 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 I'd like your reaction to it. You're familiar with it. I think this goes to the heart of uh, Mr. Obama's uh, budget proposal of last week, where he's basically saying we will auction all the allowances and then we'll recycle that revenue in the form of paying for the middle income tax cut, perhaps assisting uh, poor no people in terms of paying their electric bills and that sort of thing. And so I think that's the heart of it. And it, it's, it's very intriguing because you look at it from an economic standpoint, the way to reduce the overall cost of climate regulation, the best way, is to recycle the money and use it as tax shifting to eliminate more dis more distortionary taxes. It, it could cut the cost by 50 percent, so we get more environmental bang for our buck by doing a portion of that. So I think that's what we're talking about, the idea of putting it back through the tax code and taking now, obviously, we have other needs. We've got some key energy uh, technologies we want to see developed and so on, so it's not like do all of it, but I think the administration's starting by saying that's where they'd like to go, a small piece is for technology and a small piece is for uh, the poor, uh, which is important, but I think it's an opening bid. But I think the idea is a very intriguing one and one that makes it possible to do more in terms of the climate target uh, for less, which is, of course, we want to do in today's economic context. But essentially, we would be giving permits to pollute, to, to pollute. Um, and, and there are those who would say that when those permits to pollute uh, 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 are granted, that many businesses will just consider that the cost of doing business and that we, we, we don't inhibit their uh, or prohibit uh, their ability to uh, emit greenhouse gases uh, because they just you know pay 
pay for it and and uh, and, and continue. Do, do you think that's realistic, or do you think that? And maybe that maybe the, the tough economic times today uh, would, would would also have an impact on businesses uh, where they would be a little hesitant about uh, uh, creating another cost of doing business. Well, remember when you when you. This auction idea, you're basically setting a cap, which requires, in his case, he's saying 14% reduction below 2005 levels of the President's proposal. So we're going to cap the total amount that pollution that's allowed, and we're only going to sell permits up to that level of cap. So we're going to get a significant emission reduction. We're not going to let them buy as many as they want and then pollute to their heart's delight. We're basically saying we're, we're setting that cap, and wherever you set the cap determines the environmental uh, results. So I think it, it, it has both in it. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Great. The gentleman's time has expired. The Chair recognizes the gentleman from Washington State, Mr. Inslee. Hello. Thank you. Um, I'm sorry. I've just been able to join you, and you may have talked about this, but I would just like your thoughts on what we should ask China on either a bilateral or multilateral agreement. So the two questions I have is, should we address a bilateral agreement with China? And second, whether it's bilateral or multilateral, what should we, what is a realistic request of China? Um, is it an intensity number of CO2 in their economy? Is it an investment number? Is it a cafe number? Is it a combination of those things? And uh, I'd appreciate any and all of your thoughts on those subjects. to Barbara, but she wants me to go first. Uh, my sense is that China, in their climate plan of April last year, laid out reductions they would achieve in various sectors. I think they're very focused on sector-based rather than national targets. So we'll do this in cement, we'll do this in steel, we'll do this in electricity, we'll do this in oil refining. And I think that's what we should look for. And I think what you expect, what China talks about all the time is doing this via technology. So in a five-year plan, they've said to us, or you want us to make reductions in cement, we could do so many pounds of carbon per ton of cement. But we would rather say, in 2020, 80 percent of our plants will have waste heat recirculation. 70 percent will blend the cement with uh, waste you know, slag and that sort of thing. 40 percent will do these other. So putting this in terms of technology is what China really understands and really relates to. Their, their negotiators say to me, you know, setting that emission target, well, if there's a lot of growth, We'll have a lot of new plants, the intensity will improve. If the economy tanks, like it's doing now, we'll build less new plants and, and we'll do worse in terms of the intensity target. So we're not sure we can get to that emission number, but we can confidently say to you, we can do this much of this technology, this much, or it's equivalent, this much of that technology. So I think the discussion with China really needs to be, it has to be about how big is this, is it substantial, is it material, the terms of total reductions but in the specifics of help with technologies. That's, if you look at their submissions and their talk in the debate, that's where they're focused. They see this as the, the piece that's missing. The CDM doesn't help them build new innovative technologies. It just pays for today's technology. And thereafter, that next round, as Barbara was saying, that improves their efficiency and makes them more competitive. Um, um, I do agree with that, and I'd just like to add two more points. One is that there's a tremendous amount of mistrust that has grown up uh, uh, between the two countries over the years on this issue. And I believe there's a lot that can be done uh, uh, outside, the, both within and outside the context of the international climate negotiations to help prepare for Copenhagen between the U.S. and China, b which together account for 40 percent of all CO2 emissions in the world. So I, we have developed a set of recommendations for how to strengthen the U.S.-China climate engagement. That includes both uh, suggestions for how the two countries should focus their bilateral discussions on to, uh, to come up with common ground on some of the key sticking points in the international climate negotiations, such as the financial uh, mechanisms and the uh, technology transfers. Um, but I also suggest, um, and this is, I think, very much in line with Secretary Clinton's uh, uh, statements on her trip to, to Beijing recently, which is there's tremendous opportunity here for bilateral cooperation um, on clean energy in particular. And this has two effects. One is that it can help to reduce the amount of mistrust that has built up. Uh, I think it can provide economic benefits for both countries. And most importantly, no matter what agreement is reached at Copenhagen, um, you're going to have this implementation problem. 
uh, in China and other developing countries, and whatever bilateral efforts that uh, you jumpstart right now are going to help jumpstart the implementation process. And I believe there's a lot that can be done at a very low cost uh, to the United States in helping to uh, provide technical assistance to China, and that's the key area that should be explored now. Thank you. I want to ask one more question. I'll take these, y your answer, Mr. Roberts, Mr. Lane, writing if I can. I've got limited time here. Should there be an, um, an international uh, research and development coalition or entity that is funded by the countries of the world? Um, should there be one unified which will not be the exclusive place for an R&D, but should there be sort of one institute that we all contribute to to, to generate uh, new technologies in this regard? Maybe Mr. Roberts and Mr. Lane, if you have thoughts that. Yes. Um, not necessarily. Um, I, I believe that there needs to be some mechanisms for uh, developing new technologies. Does there need to be one institute that drives that? I'm not so sure. I believe what we've seen in bilateral uh, uh, negotiations between countries are a wealth of possibilities for cooperation between the U.S. and China, U.S. and India, U.S. and Brazil. Does all of that need to be centralized? I'm not so sure. What we do need to do is make sure that we reach economies of scale and ensure the fastest possible transfer of technology so we're not all trying to reinvent the same wheel at the same time. Mr. Lane, did you want to? I, I just wanted to say, as I interpreted your, your question, sir, you were not necessarily, you were indeed saying the opposite, that it didn't have to be the only uh, vehicle, but just that there should be some. Right, uh, just uh, with the Chairman's permission. I mean, Senator Voinovich through the, asked Tony Blair this question the other day, and, and, and to me, there's a certain uh, maybe romantic attraction to this idea that we're going to have some joint global R&D program. And maybe it's only 1% of our entire national R&D budgets. But to me, there is a certain charm of the world uniting in an R&D project, even if it's just a small portion of our sort of global research budget. I, it's just one congressman speaking. <laughs> there, there is no question from our perspective that <clears throat> the more the world can come together and bring technology and finance to bear on these issues in a focused way, the better. And, and so there will be opportunities, in fact, an imperative for us to take a, a cooperative, consolidated approach. And it will mean creating some new global institutions along I mean, the lines of what you, you've described. When you think how we eradicated smallpox and how we've done some of these other, these were globally unified efforts. And they were not exclusive, but they were unified. Anyway, thank you. <coughs> okay, could I, if I could follow up on Mr. Inslee's uh, question, go to you, Ms. Fenimore. Um, China just passed the new stimulus package. Yes. Uh, could, you could you tell us a little bit about uh, how much money they put into energy and environment, and uh, if you know how much they put into research in that uh, subject, because all of these global stimulus packages are constructed differently, but it would be interesting, I think, for us to understand what China did in this one uh, particular field. I'd be happy to. So uh, last November, China passed or announced a stimulus package uh, equaling 4 trillion renminbi, which I is equivalent to about 600 billion, almost 600 billion dollars U.S. Uh, it's a two-year program. It spreads out over uh, 10 sectors. and. Um, we have, um, there's a big discussion this week, actually, it's the annual meeting of the National People's Congress, so there's a big debate on whether or not it should be expanded. So we could be hearing from the Premier um, uh, on Thursday when he announces uh, uh, the, uh, the National People's Congress, he may actually uh, expand the stimulus package. Um, almost all of this four trillion renminbi is for infrastructure uh, construction, particularly railways, which um, um, in, you know, as, as opposed to developing its uh, highway system, which also gets a, a, a lot of funds but not that much, it's good for, in general for uh, mass transit purposes, for reducing emissions from transportation. There is some concern that it's going to require greater, uh, you know, greater manufacturing of steel and concrete to build out the railway system. Um, 
350 billion renminbi, or $50 billion, is earmarked for energy efficiency and environmental protection projects specifically, but I would, um, I would argue that there is an opportunity here for China to spend a lot of the remaining parts of its stimulus package in a way that is going to promote uh, sustainable development and, re and, and reduce emissions. In particular, a lot of the money uh, uh, one trillion renminbi is going to go towards... How much is that again? Of, uh, <laughs> divide by seven. Um, yeah. We'll go towards reducing or, or rehabilitating the areas devastated by the earthquake. In other words, building. And if China uh, it, uh, puts environmental criteria on this, this building, it could go a long way in reducing right. its... Let population. me go to Mr. Roberts. So um, recently a report issued by HSBC Global Research compared stimulus packages across many countries and, and looked at what percentage of the overall stimulus package was <coughs> devoted to a low carbon economy. And while it praised the United States for the efforts toward a green economy, it, it uh, evaluated our package and, and, and determined that about 12 percent of our package is going to a low carbon economy. By contrast, about 38 percent of the Chinese stimulus package by the same definition is going toward a low carbon economy. So it's much more oriented toward the things we're talking about. So you're saying that 12 percent of 800 billion is going to a low carbon ec economy, but 37 percent of 600 billion is going to a low carbon economy? According to the HSBC Global and, Research Study. And who are they again? HSBC is a, a, a global bank. It's a consumer uh -huh. bank out of uh, London and has taken a keen interest in these issues because they're a consumer-based bank with branches throughout China and Europe okay, and great. Thank you. the world. Uh, and there's a measure on energy efficiency in China that caught my attention. It's the Top 1000 program. Uh, could any of you elaborate on that program, how it works and how effective it is, Mr. Helm or Ms. Dunamore? I think that's the same one that she was referring to in her testimony, the uh, energy efficiency mm -hmm. uh, program. And my recollection is the data, uh, they wanted 4 percent a year, and in the first year they got like 1.2, but in the last two years, 2007, 2008, we're close. We were just under 4 in 2007 and over 4 in 2008, so well on track. And as uh, Barbara indicated, it's just 300 million tons a year, very significant. Well, uh, just as Mr. Helm said that we can reach a global climate initiative by focusing on just five or six developing countries, China has found that it can go a long way towards achieving its ambitious energy efficiency goals by focusing just on just 1,000 factories. And that's what this top 1,000 factory is, uh, program is. Together, this uh, 1,000 enterprises constitute 33 percent, one-third of national energy consumption and nearly half of the, all its industrial energy consumption. They've targeted these plants. They've required every one of them to do an energy audit, hire energy managers. They have quotas, and they have apparently on track to achieve their uh, quotas for each one of these 1,000 facilities. Okay. Can we move to uh, Mexico? Uh, you, we heard the testimony here that they want to cut their emissions in half by 2050. Now, some people might doubt the effectiveness of the Mexican government. Uh, given what's going on with the drug cartels down there. Uh, and that will be the first issue that people raise. What is the capacity for the government of Mexico to uh, implement such uh, a bold plan? Uh, do any of you want to you know, speak to that issue? Uh, Mr. Helm. Mexico's thing I cited in terms of the details, the minus 50 is their aspirational goal. The President's put that in. They're going to release their climate uh, national climate strategy in the next month or so, and as part of that, they will have specific goals for specific sectors, and that's, I, I cited the, the four sectors, so cement, steel, oil refining, and, and electricity. Importantly, we've looked at those sectors. Steel and, and cement are fairly efficient, com more efficient than U.S. production, for example. The two other sectors, electricity and oil refining, are national uh, uh, companies, if you will. They're nationalized. They are incredibly inefficient. The oil refining Pemex is the worst scored refinery in the world mm -hmm. compared to any of the other world uh, mm -hmm. oil refining companies. So, but the good news is these are nationally run agencies. So we have a good chance, I think, with the government being able to take this on. And mm -hmm. uh, the president, President Calderon, is very knowledgeable about climate. He was the energy secretary before he became president. He knows these agencies inside out, and he's got a real. He's, he's brought them in. 
got a commitment from both of them to play and to, and to really step up and do some things, and there's some huge opportunities. Example, there's 3,000 megawatts of cogeneration right there on the table today at these oil refineries and chemical plants. They could do tomorrow. They haven't been able to do it because Mexican law basically says CFE, the utility, decides what they pay, like we used to do before you all passed the energy reform in 1992, decides what they pay. And of course, they pay nothing, and so nobody builds a cogeneration. So these things can be turned around. They're not costly. That's my point for Mr. Sensenbrenner. This isn't buckets of money. This is simple loans to get them over the top to, to capitalize the thing. So I'm optimistic. You're right. There are some real issues there. But I think there's a deep commitment uh, at the president level, and, and he has the legal authority. We're not in a situation where he has to pass a new law. He has authority to move forward with these efforts. Okay, my time has expired. I'd like to give uh, Mr. Cleaver and Mr. Inslee time for additional questions if they're interested. Uh, gentleman from Washington. Um, let me then come back. Mr. Roberts, did you want to uh, uh, make a point on Mexico. I, I was just, I've uh, been to Mexico seven times this past year, and I would agree with the assessment that President Calderon is serious about uh, climate change. Maria Molina, the Nobel Prize winning scientist, is his advisor on these issues. From from uh, Lexington, Massachusetts, in my district? That's Mar great. Mario Molina. That's great. Uh, and, um, <laughs> and, um, uh, and the business leaders in Mexico, um, uh, most of the business leaders in Mexico are quite committed to this and moving their industries in the right direction. I think there's a real opportunity in Mexico. And um, you raise a, and a, it, the president has his hands full uh, addressing the drug cartels in Mexico, but at the same time, among the leaders in the world, I've seen him make a stronger commit to, commitment to this, a personal commitment to this than most, so. Yep. Um, remember that scene in, uh, Annie Hall, where uh, Woody Allen was listening to somebody critique a movie, and Masha McLuhan turns around to uh, to uh, comment. Well, I had a session like that in my district in 1995, 1,500 people, and someone got up to, this, and I had it in Lexington to uh, critique, you know, all of the analysis of ozone depletion and all that. And then this other man went over to the microphone and said, "Well, you know, I." I won the Nobel Prize uh, on that subject, and, and uh, that's what can happen in Lexington uh, <coughs> when you're having a discussion on issues of this nature. Uh, let, me, uh, uh, let me give each of you then uh, one minute to summarize what it is that you want us to um, remember uh, as we're going forward in terms of uh, these developing countries. Uh, and uh, what are reasonable expectations uh, for our country and the world, uh, both in 2009 and the years ahead, uh, because I think that is going to be the way in which this deba debate gets framed. Uh, it will be in that long-term economic context of where the burdens are and how they are going to be shared. So why don't we go in uh, reverse order, uh, and uh, we will begin with you, uh, Mr. Helm. This may not be a popular answer, but I think, Chairman, the, the key issue here in the negotiations is the financing. And it's a tough sell here in the Congress, but I think it's, you know, in terms of our good faith, as I said, there are two tests for the U.S. One is, do we have a real target? Is it strong? I think we can deliver on that side. And can we step up and show that we're willing to help? The developing countries feel that, you know, the 1992 Rio Treaty and the 1997 Kyoto Protocol both said Annex 1 will pay, you know, incremental costs. They'll contribute to this, this, and this. And the track record's been basically dismal, very little uh, to show for it. And obviously we're in a tough financial time here in economic times, but I think we need to think of targeted ways that we can show good faith and move this ball forward. I think China is really ready to act. Mexico, Korea, Brazil, they're all ready. India I put in a different category, but the others are really serious. I think China will step up and outdo us if we show good faith. And I don't think it's about billions. It's about good faith and saying, yes, we'll help you with technology. We'll help you with capacity building, as my colleagues have said. So I think that's the bottom line. Great. Well, thank you, Mr. Helm. Mr. Lane. Uh, Mr. Markey, I guess I would say that the sign of commitment on the climate issue is really a willingness to impose a price on carbon emissions. And I would be inclined to use that as the standard for assessing 
whether developing countries and developed countries are actually serious about reducing their greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, are there comparable prices being put on greenhouse gas emissions? I don't think it necessarily has to be a high price to begin with, uh, but I think we need to keep an eye on the relative prices and to make sure that ours don't get out of line with the rest of the world. I guess the only other point I would add to that is that it seems to me that this is likely to be an iterative procedure. We need to continue to monitor this and adjust our behavior to make sure that it stays in line with the behavior of our major trading partners. Using your measurement of serious, would you say that the price which is being set in the European community right now is serious? Uh, yes, I would. I would point out that their price applies to only a relatively small percentage of their total greenhouse gas emissions, though. And it's, it's important to keep in mind what emissions are covered and how much of a country's total emissions are actually being covered by the control system. But they're serious about the portions that they are covering. I believe that that, okay. uh, yes. Um, anything that gets us started toward having uh, a price on emissions, I think, is a step in the right direction and a, a good point for further negotiations. Thank you, Mr. Lane. Mr. Roberts. There is no substitute here at home for putting a price on carbon. Uh, all the things we're talking about will not go to scale. W the investments w won't happen without putting a price on carbon. At the same time, we can't expect every other country to make the same kind of commitment that we make. And it's clearly been established that there will be differentiated commitments uh, that reflect different countries' political context. The, um, my final comments would be we need global reductions to solve the problems we have here at home. The smart money is not to spend all of our money here in the U.S., but actually to provide financing and technology to achieve low-cost solutions elsewhere in the world, because a ton in China, a ton in Mexico affects us just as much as a ton created here in the U.S. And so I do believe that smart provision of financing, not just to clean technologies, but also to adaptation through instruments like the Global Environmental Fund are essential to address the problem. And I believe that we need to create partnerships with other countries through bilateral negotiations and through Copenhagen to make this happen. Thank you, Mr. Roberts, very much. Ms. Benamor. Um, I would uh, once again like to urge the uh, committee to look beneath the uh, negotiating posture of China to the tremendous progress that's already been made and the tremendous Air areas of common ground that uh, exist between the two countries in order to break through the stalemate that's existed for so many years on climate issues. And uh, a lot of the work that can be done should be going on now with bilateral dialogue. Some of the uh, efforts are going on now is to bring together uh, legislatures from the U.S. and China to talk of, uh, about these issues. Uh, whenever we go to China, my executive director is there right now, we get questions about what is the U.S. thinking. There's a lot, not a lot of um, understanding about what's happening with this new administration, but a tremendous amount of interest. And I would also say that the bilateral uh, work that needs to be done has already begun. In fact, NRDC has been working for over 13 years and bringing together experts from both the U.S. government and, uh, and California and other leading states in the U.S. on these kind of technology transfer uh, uh, technical assistance programs. So this can form the backbone of, a, of an expanded effort. Just last week, for example, we brought the new uh, acting chairman of the Federal Electricity Regulatory Commission to China to speak at a major energy efficiency conference that we sponsored, and we got this uh, Secretary of Energy to, 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 uh, to participate by video. And so I think there's, um, we look forward to working with you as we move forward on these issues. Thank you, Ms. Uh, Fenimore, uh, very much. And thank you for traveling from um, Beijing to deliver your testimony today. Uh, there's no evidence of any jet lag in your performance here today. And uh, we uh, thank you for that. Um, so there is good news. Um, 
of, of a sort. Um, we have learned that China's goal by the end of this year is to be the leading exporter of renewable energy technology in the world. That is good news and, of course, it is bad news because that should be something that we are touting in the United States. Uh, Brazil has established a goal of reducing deforestation by 70 percent and we have heard the litany. Uh, but at the end of the day, as our witnesses have told us, uh, to construct a, a global treaty, uh, we are going to need uh, measurable uh, goals that are accepted by uh, all of the developing countries uh, in the world as well. And uh, that must be articulated uh, in partnership with the developed uh, nations. And the United States, in order to achieve this goal, must be a leader, not a laggard, uh, when we reach uh, Copenhagen. So uh, that is the goal that the Congress has set for itself this year, to develop legislation that will allow the President to go to that negotiation as a credible uh, negotiating uh, partner with the other nations in the world. So we thank each of you for your testimony. With that, this hearing is adjourned.